Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Public Eye. My name is Fumi Inyoda, and today our topic is going to be about energy, renewable energy. It's a global conversation. Many, many countries have signed on to the charter that by in 50 years time, so much of what we know as sources of energy will no longer be used by majority of the world. For Nigeria, what would that mean? Already, we do have some sort of an energy crisis or we call it an electricity crisis. Somebody told me recently that it's not a crisis if it doesn't even exist in the first instance, that maybe we don't have an energy crisis, we have a greed crisis. But then, would renewable energy offer an opportunity to completely segue from a problem that is, has been intractable for decades into a future where we can light up the country? Well, that's the kind of conversation we'll be having on this innovation edition of Public Eye, right after I take this break. Since 1956, when crude oil was discovered in the Niger Delta region of Oloibiri, a small community in the Ogbea local government area of Bayelsa State, Nigeria has largely been dependent on the revenue generated from the economic value of fussy fuels. However, the world is gradually transitioning from fussy fuels to electric power. The reason is simple, to stem the issue of climate change and protect the climate from further decline. With Nigeria largely depending on profits from fussy fuels, it has become important for the people, government, and other stakeholders to seek alternatives in the area of green and renewable energy. Globally, the fourth industrial revolution is rapidly taking over and is characterized by highly advanced technologies, automated electric vehicles, robotics, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology, among other innovations and inventions. In Nigeria, several individuals and institutions are pushing against all socio-economic limitations to speed up Nigeria's transition into this new era. 9th April 2021, the federal government unveiled the first 100% solar-powered electric vehicle EV charging station in Sokoto. 13th July 2021, the federal government commissioned another solar-powered electric vehicle charging station at the University of Lagos, Unilag. 9th February 2022, Nigeria's first locally assembled electric car, Hyundai Kona, was unveiled. And on 7th April 2022, the Federal Ministry of Power unveiled 10 electric-powered motorcycles in Lagos, manufactured by Max Nigeria under its electric vehicle opportunities in rural and peri-urban communities in Nigeria. We are in the era where everything will be powered electrically cars, trucks, and buses, all powered by electricity. But how ready is Nigeria, given the state of unstable power supply across the country? Nigeria must look into whatever advanced technology is being leveraged by developed countries around the world, identify, transfer, and optimize for the good of its people. Right, welcome back everyone. It's Public Eye and our conversation today is going to be around renewable energy. We are focusing on innovation to start with. The current situation with Nigeria's power and electricity and all issues around that, everybody would agree, through the decades, is unacceptable. However, are we going to leave it like that? Are we going to continue to complain and fight and do whatever it is we've done for 30, 40 odd years? What is possible in the future? That will be the cross of our conversation today. And I have the first guest whom I'm delighted has flown in this today from my degree in Borno State. Mustafa Gajibo is an autom automobile engineer. He's um, an inventor and also, in my mind, somewhat of a genius, really. Um, he's also a renewable energy, um, I don't want to use the word advocate or activist, realist, because apparently that's the reality for tomorrow. Good to have you. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm fine. So I see you're wearing a P on your, on your booba. Yeah. That's for Phoenix Energy. Yeah, yeah. Very smart. That's the name of your company. Yeah, Phoenix Renewable. Phoenix Renewable. Yes. You're not a person that's easily satisfied, are you? Yeah. <laughs> you're wondering why I asked that question. <laughs> yes. Well, because... How many times did they, did they admit you to university and you started and you say, I beg, no? 
<laughs> How many times? Like uh, up to two times. You always knew from get go that you wanted to study um, mechanical engineering, mm, right? Yes, yes. But then they admitted you wanted to go to my University of Maiduguri. Yeah, I, first uh, I got admission into University of Maiduguri, the uh, general agri. Uh, but I uh, actually wanted to study electrical engineering, actually. Uh, then uh, the second time, I was able to get mechanical engineering. Uh, I tried to change the course. You know how the uh, education sector is in the country. Mm. You don't always get uh, what you want. Yes, yeah. you hardly ever get what you want. I yeah. wanted to study law. Wow. And they gave me geography. <laughs> and this is me doing geography. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so eventually you did get into the university to study, I think, mechanical engineering. Yes, yes. But yes. you didn't finish. Yeah, I couldn't. You left yeah, in I the left. third year, a yeah. year to go. Yes. What yes. did your parents think about that? Yeah, it was a crazy idea. Uh, I would say most of the people were not in support, but the family and friends. Uh, but uh, I knew what I wanted and uh, I saw it coming and I just took the decision. I want, to, I want you to explain that bit where you say I knew what I wanted. You say it casually, but we come from this society and we know that that's not easy to get what you want as against what everybody thinks is best for you. Mm. How were you, and it couldn't have been an easy decision. Yeah. One, you already left one time, you went back, and now you are considering leaving almost at the end of it. What was it that made you certain that I just have to do this? Yeah, I saw a lot of potentials in what I was doing as at that time. Uh, right before I go into the university, uh, I've been into the renewable energy sector. Uh, at my year two, I had a company which I registered, which at, uh, as at that time, uh, I've already get, got engaged in uh, some projects, not only within the city of Meduguri, but even outside the city. Uh, at year two, I was doing a project for a university also. That's the Federal University of Technology in Oware, mm -hmm. uh, in Imo. So uh, I just saw what I was doing better than uh, just going into uh, the academic uh, sector. But uh, knowing fully that, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, you know, our our curriculums in the universities are not actually matching the, the current situation of the world and uh, what the, the, the trends are going on in the world. So uh, I saw that uh, I gained more and I learned more doing what I was doing at that time than even in the school. So what you're explaining, and that's a very important thing to focus on, is that your decision was not an irrational decision. It was actually a strategic, smart move. Yeah. Because what you were getting was not serving the purpose to start with. Yeah. And already you were working in the field. You were already doing what you wanted to do. Because yeah. I know you had MTech, yeah. your first company. You already yes, registered yes. whilst you were in the yeah. university. Yes. The elephant in the room right now is you are from Medjugorje in Borono State. Yes. And if we do the mathematics of dates, you know, so it would be that you're talking about second year, first year, is it all this conversation is about the past five to seven years, yes. isn't it? Yes. The past five to seven years have also been a very difficult time Times. in my degree because very, of the very, security situation very, and the very. insurgency. Yeah. So it's very interesting to see somebody not only be there throughout all of that, but be doing the kind of work you are doing also yeah. across Nigeria, because yeah. you're also doing some work for University of Oweri. Yeah. Tell us how, what that's like, really. I mean, what everybody's thinking. I mean, I always ask the question that people are not asking, why are you not Boko Haram? <laughs> you know... Because that's uh, a thought. The thing, it, it seems like every young man there, that's your... Yeah. That, that's what you Yes, do. you know, as you said, uh, last five, six to seven years in Meruguri, uh, we're having a lot of problems. Uh, there was a time even the university itself had to shut down operations due to the continued uh, insecurity, uh, a lot of violence, bombings, and uh, that, I would say to me, you know, whenever, I always believe that wherever there is problems, there are opportunities. Uh, as at that time, the, the electricity grid to Medugri was cut off, and uh, there was no electricity in Medugri. To me, I saw a lot of opportunity. There was so much problem. People could not even charge their mobile phones. 
uh, it was at that time I took that as an advantage to uh, prefer for solutions to those problems. So what I always believe is uh, wherever there's problems, you always, all problems always come with opportunities. So through that, uh, it was a setback for the whole uh, state and for almost everyone living in that area. But uh, to me, whenever I see problems, I straight go back to my drawing boards and tables to see how I can come up with solutions. However, I want to see, I want to understand how you zeroed in on electric cars because there are very many, I mean, very many, I don't want our conversation to be about slogans, you know? So usually because there's a lot of talk about, you know, environmental con conservation, about nature, about all of that now, we don't bring it down to the brass tacks of what that really means. And so for you, what was the first solution you proffered? Because I know about your cars, the electric cars, and your determination that we'll have electric buses in future. But where did you start from? Which solution did you start from? Yeah, in the sector of uh, electric vehicles, uh, after we have uh, grown big in the renewable energy sector, uh, we went into building of uh, lithium batteries, which I would say are the primary uh, source of uh, raw materials for building electric vehicles because uh, without the batteries you can't build electric vehicles so uh, first of all uh, I would say my company is one of the first companies in Nigeria which uh, started building uh, lithium ion battery packs uh, which are the best technology of uh, storage systems uh, so uh, being did, did you start from the because before you went on to the cars you wanted to solve the problems specifically in my degree about power, people couldn't charge their phones, yeah. they couldn't move and all of that. Is it to say that you started with batteries then or what? Yes, uh, I wanted to explain how we went into the electric vehicles. Okay. When, uh, when we got really good in building lithium battery packs uh, and then we now saw a problem also within our society. Uh, prices of fuels are going up all the time prices of uh, transportation fees are also going up and uh, damages, uh, normal uh, internal combustion engines uh, cost to our environments. You see a lot of floods, a lot of uh, droughts and so many uh, natural disasters which are caused due to uh, global warming, emission of carbon uh, monoxide and others to the environment. So. Uh, we now decided to go into building of electric vehicles to also solve that problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, we started by uh, focusing on mainly the mass transit systems, which uh, let me say constitute to about 50 to 70 percent of uh, our movement within our cities in Nigeria. Uh, if you can see today, almost every city in Nigeria have a lot of uh, tricycles, buses and others which are used commercially for uh, mass transit system. So and these uh, emissions these vehicles produce constitute to almost 90 percent of uh, most of our respiratory diseases, uh, pollutions and others, direct pollutions which uh, affect human beings. Uh, mainly coming from uh, the vehicles we use around us. So that's why we came up with the first tricycle. That was last two years. We came up with the first prototype for electric tricycle, which uh, covers up to 200 kilometers on one charge and can charge in a very uh, short period of time, just 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, we were able to build a lot of that uh, which was deployed for mass city transit across the country. Yeah, I'm interested in what the source of the yeah. energy that, the, what renewable, what's the source of that renewable energy? Yes. Because of course, the, the fact that it's renewable means that it's, it's regenerative. So it doesn't yes. mean that, you know, it's dumped somewhere, yes. making a big mess that the, the earth cannot, cannot do something yes. about. But what is the source of it? Yes, the source of energy If it's is a trade secret, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> but I'm no, curious. No, no. Yeah, it is, uh, we don't have a, a specific source of energy for our vehicles. You know, 
Renewable sources of energy depends on the environment. Anywhere you go, it has its own natural sources of energy. Right. Yes, uh, that's why I was trying to explain the whole uh, chain. Uh, in a place like Meduguri, where we started the whole project, uh, we're using wind and uh, solar power panels to generate the power to charge those uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. But uh, moving further, in places where you have no more much sun energy per day and, uh, and the wind speed is low also, we are also preferring for look, uh, coming up with solutions so, to, so to generate energy using renewable energy sources to charge the vehicles. I'm really excited about that, you mm. know, because what you're explaining is a respect for the earth, a, res a respect for the local environment, wherever it is you mm, go, yes. because some parts you have wind, that's enough, other parts is not mm, wind, so was. maybe it's solar. Yes. Some other parts, who knows what you will find. Fine. So it means that you really also have to engage yes. with that local yes. community yes. where you are going, which builds a more cohesive um, society. The future for you is you want to make sure that Phoenix is able to supply mass transit buses all over Nigeria. How close are we to that future? We're very close to that future. Uh, with what we have done so far, uh, already uh, we've got a lot of uh, people who are interested uh, and a lot of uh, people who are interested in partnering with us to upscale what we're doing. And uh, in a very, very uh, near future, we will start uh, mass production of these vehicles and uh, we will be deploying them all around the country. Right. In terms of, you're talking about people partnering with you now. Are these Nigerian institutions, international institutions? I also ask the question because I know that there's a big move internationally for renewable energy, especially in the area that you are focusing on to start with. So I'm wondering, let it not be that tomorrow now, we import all the electric cars. <laughs> Or we yes. import all the renewable energy vehicle and products rather than make a significant amount of them, not just for ourselves, but for other countries. Yes, uh, uh, that's why uh, I was part of even the policy making team for uh, the electric vehicle development plan for Nigeria, which is done by the National Automotive Design and Development Council. Uh, even at that uh, committee, we were very focused on uh, developing local manufacturing. So, uh, you know, the whole automotive industry has been left for the foreigners to run for us. So I believe with the revolution of uh, new energy vehicles, uh, it is now time for us to take it back and uh, become big in it. So. We are working very hard. That's why uh, we, the local manufacturers, have better competitive advantage than people who bring in vehicles from other countries. Because it is we who are with you that will understand what you need. And it is we can build what is within your purchasing power. We have a lot of uh, brand new vehicles in Nigeria. With, but uh, 90, let me say 95% of Nigeria cannot afford it because these vehicles were built abroad, were built based on uh, the purchasing power of the people there. They are not uh, putting into consideration what our people can afford. So uh, in Phoenix, as a company, we one of the main things we put into consideration when designing a vehicle is to make sure that vehicle is within the purchasing power of Nigerians. And I can assure you that uh, uh, with this competitive advantage that we're having, we will be the leading when it comes to uh, electric vehicles in Nigeria and Africa at large. Um, my notes say that you're only 29. Yes. Yes, you're just 29. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's really cool. Yeah. So uh, the question is your company, what sort of people are in your company? You lead the company. Yes, uh, uh, we, I have a co-founder uh, who is a friend who we started the Phoenix after, you, after having MTech Renewables. 
I decided to partner with a friend, uh, Sadiq Abakar Isa, which uh, I, we were supposed to be here together, but uh, he, has, he, he has went for a lesser hajj in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, he's not around. So uh, he is the co-founder of the company, and uh, we run the company together. So how do you recruit, recruit people who work with you? We don't actually believe in uh, certificates. We don't uh, bring in people based on uh, the schools they went to. We just bring in people based on uh, what they can do, actually. Uh, let me just give you an, a simple example. Uh, we're working, building the first prototype of our bus. And uh, one of the circuits, it was a 2021 circuit bus. And uh, it was designed 2021 because it's even labeled 2021 on it. And uh, we brought in those cycles from Japan, one of the best technology hardware producers. And uh, the, the circuit got burned due to some technical errors while we were working. And uh, I was like so discouraged because it would take me about three to five months to bring in new one. So, but uh, someone advised me that uh, there's someone that can repair that. And it was a little boy, so it, 17 years old, I think. So he, he named Bilia and uh, they recommended him for me to, uh, he can fix it. So he doesn't even have a mobile phone. We have to do a manual search to get him. Uh, when we got him, I, I saw him wearing slippers, uh, dressed somehow, and I, I was discouraged. But uh, I said, okay, I have nothing to lose. It's already damaged, so just try, try your luck. So uh, within a few minutes, he was able to identify the faults on it. And uh, what surprised me, he didn't even, he didn't just repair or change some components in it, but he built a new component that replicates the old one. And uh, within hours, and spending just less than 2,000 Naira, he was able to put that uh, cycle box back to life. That's, so, an, that's, that's, that's such an incredible story. So, uh, <laughs> and I was like, ah, uh, what was, well, did, uh, what, what's your qualifications or something? He, he told me, no, he has never gone to classroom. Never gone to school yeah. at all? Yes. And uh, based on that, he got an automatic uh, employment into our research and development team. So that's how we bring in people on board. That is, I mean, you told me, I, I love this story on every level. Because the story you just told itself is a story of renewable energy. Mm. Because to fly in an expert from Japan, that's a lot of carbon mm. foot footprint. <laughs> that's why it's a lot of money. <laughs> but here, somewhere in my degree, was yeah. a 17 year old yes. boy without any education so yes. far who had the skill, the knowledge. And the other bit I like is that you did not also allow yourself, you are building a kind of company where who you are is what matters. It matters, yes. You know, so you didn't say, okay, let's send him to school first. No, no, to no. go and dabaru everything. No, no, no. no. You put him in the research, in the research and, development and development team, development. which is yes. where he needs to be. Yes. I truly, really like that story. Yes. Um, you know, it's a little challenging for girls in that we don't even, when it comes to science and tech, we don't expose girl children enough yes. for them to even be able to start picking up on things. Uh, right now, we have up to four girls who are part of our team. Uh, one is in the electrical team. The other is on the mechanical team. And uh, they are doing really good. Uh, they just went to a polytechnic. Uh, one of them has graduated last year, but the other is still uh, at her final year. And uh, they are doing very good. Uh, actually, they developed passion in it. Uh, they really love it. So, and uh, we are also looking at increasing the number of uh, women in our Thunder. team. So I'm glad that you have built that already into the structure mm, yes. um, of the company. Yeah, as I said, you are only 29. What's your own vision? One, for your con a company. Two, also, for the, for the whole conversation about you know, um, energy in Nigeria and how that can impact you know, the future for Nigeria? Yes, uh, for my company, I think the vision is to be the leading electric vehicle manufacturer in the whole of Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. Uh, 
And uh, in terms of energy in our country, I think uh, my vision is to see we come up with ways and solutions to solve the energy problems we're having in the country and generate the energy using renewable energy sources. It's very possible. Uh, we have a lot of uh, power potentials, most especially in Nigeria, to like power our whole energy needs using renewable energy sources. You can see the sun today. Uh, the, the, one of the best source of energy is the sun. The sun today, if the whole power, let me say the whole energy produced by the sun for just a day can be stored, maybe in a battery or something, it's able to power the whole world for the next 50 years. So, and we have abundance of this in this country. We have about average of six to seven hours of uh, sun per day, which is very, very enough to power. And that aside, we have many, many other ways of uh, generating energy, wind, uh, Lagos, you have high wind in uh, speed, and uh, so many ways, biogas, and many other, even hydrogen today. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, ways to generate power using even hydrogen cells and others. So right. I think it's very possible. Very. Thank you. I mean, from what you have said and what we realize, we have no reason to be in the situation that we are in. Everything we need is here. Yes. You know, and um, I'm hoping and trusting and believing that the future is here and the future will build the future that will come, you know, in that regard. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to keep you here because we have someone, you know, a couple of other gentlemen who will join us. We'll take a break. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I'll go with you and come back and Okay, welcome back. It's Public Eye. And we are having a conversation that I think, you know, is one of the most conversations in the world right now you know, for many, many reasons. And in the studio with me, I have, you know, two gentlemen who will continue what we have started with Mustafa, who is also still in the studio. I'm going to start with the gentleman directly in front of me because he's Nigeria's foremost, most renowned, most recognizable, most visible environmentalist. I have been seeing him forever. And for me, it's a pleasure that he's here today because I know that he doesn't really like to leave his natural environment. Mr. Desmond Majekodumi is an electroacoustic engineer and producer. As I said, he's a renowned environmentalist and an avowed creation care activist. I like that term. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Also sat beside him is Mr. Olumide Awoyemi, who is a science and technology expert, is the Director of Partnership and Development at Rolex Foundation, which is a science advocacy organization. Good for you to be here with us today. Uh, thank you for having me. I thank like you. the hair. Thank you. Very much. Mr. Maja Kodumi, it's been 30 years and more of preaching the gospel of environmental conservation. It seems like the world has turned in the direction that you have been in for 30 years or no. So you must be happy. <laughs> to an extent. But the thing is, when you have a window of opportunity and the window is steadily, rapidly closing, that has been proven by some of the highest level of science that humanity has been able to develop. You know, the kind of science that will take you into a trajectory in space and put you on an orbit around the Earth because you're in, in sympathy with the magnetic pull of the Earth and other magnetic pulls of other spheres. You know, this is deep science. And the scientists, <laughs> they are panicking. They are panicking. There's an international panel for climate change that was started about 30 years ago, when they started realizing that, oh, the innovations that the Western world had developed. Because, <laughs> let's not uh, try to denigrate ourselves. Because 
for Africa, Gongo, West Africa. There were innovations going on. The Benin bronzes were not just dug from the sand and then appeared like that. The Western world innovations have now started to develop in a way that the people behind the development were not evolved enough to handle. They were not responsible enough. What am I talking about? The initial problem was this climate change. That's a lot of poisonous gases were going up into the atmosphere ever since the advent of the Industrial Revolution in the West because of burning fossil fuel, coal. That was the first fuel they were burning. I'll be alive. Uh -huh. So they started realizing that when we're burning this thing, people are dying in our factories, people are getting sick in the cities because the smoke is coming out into the cities. So they started to innovate a bit better and started to improve it. And then they now got uh, the one that comes from oil, that is diesel and petrol, which is also deadly poisonous. Let me ask you a question. If I bring uh, better past my neighbor inside this place and spark it, mm -hmm. you could stay here. No. Oh, you can't stay. Why? Because when you fire fossil fuel, it emits poisonous. And those poisons are not just toxic to the mammalian life, but also to the atmosphere. So anyway, to go back 30 years ago, they started saying this thing is serious. So we're affecting the incredible, miraculous balance of the atmosphere of planet Earth. That makes it the only planet that we know of with all our science of looking into space that can support life. So panel of climate change, they started saying, we have to start doing something. They were warning people, but people didn't want to evolve because this warning would have meant maybe I have to reduce my profit, you know? And, and uh, you know, money, money answers all things, you know? But the love of money is what? The root of all evil. And because we will have this desire to just continue to maximize our profit, more and more profit, we continue the pollution, continue the pollution until 2015. There was a conference in Paris. Hey, they brought all the world leaders together and they said, look, we have to reduce this pollution now. We're reaching what they call a tipping point. That if we continue pouring this poison into the atmosphere, it's going to cause permanent damage to this miraculous system of the atmosphere and it will now cause crazy changes. Crazy changes that can even just knock humanity out of the place. Yes. So they all promised. They said, oh, yeah, okay, we're going to do something. Yeah, it's true. The scientists now, uh, people are now believing them. Guess what? After promising 2015 that they were going to reduce, including Nigeria. Yes, our president was there and he said, ah, we will reduce. By 2020, the pollution had never, ever been so high. And we had started realizing the effect of this thing. Storms that would, they call once in a hundred years. Those storms were happening like two times in 10 years. Then desert encroachment, forcing, forcing the desert, forcing the desert, causing massive insecurity. Uh -uh. In those areas now, for me, those people now, uh, they were grazing their cattle. Everybody was very happy on the green pastures there until desert came and cattle have not evolved enough to eat sand. So yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that the awareness has come, but I'm not happy at all that the young people are not taking the kind of stand that they need to take because this is their future at stake. The scientists have told us that we have maximum of 12 years to reverse this trend very, very rapidly. Otherwise, the thing becomes out of control. That you, you, no matter what science you bring, you cannot control it anymore. Anymore. Yes. I'd like to ground this conversation in Nigeria. Mm. You said something I picked on. You said those who started it were not evolved enough at the time to know that that was not the only way to have gone. Yeah, exactly. To be fighting nature, doing to it be against fight. nature. So it was, a, it was a form of science whose core idea was to overcome nature uh, uh, can you rather imagine? than arrogance to yes. understand Thank and you. blend into nature, yeah, which exactly. is what 
Mr. Mustafa was talking about earlier, but now what we look at is in this area, mm. what sort of energy that is renewable is there that we're going to use for our cars. That lovely so in guy, advocate, man, tried Yes, it. what he was talking about. So in advocating for science, it's important for the future. That's why all our audience, it's not an, it's not an accident that we bring young people here. Mm, because mm, mm. it is true, it is your future. What sort of science are we advocating for? Number one, we have two things on our hands. We have an emergency situation with the climate change mm -hmm. that involves us. Then we have a development situation. First, when we survive this, what world are we going to build? Mm. So this is exciting for me. <laughs> what do you make of it all? And what should we be now advocating? Uh, on energy issues, I am quite in the center because it is my firm belief that we must be able to marry our climate idealism with climate reality. Mm. You know, so that we will not plunge societies into energy insecurity. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, talk about countries in Europe who need eating, as it were, you get, so that they won't freeze and die. Mm -hmm. you get, and we must understand that uh, for science, any problem, as it were, that we are able to solve science, would always create more problems. So that's why I want to disagree with Dr. Maja Kodumi when he said, okay, when, the, when those fossil energy were being onboarded in the late 19th centuries, that people wanted to dominate the nature. They wanted to dominate nature and overwhelm nature. I don't think so, actually. Really. They were not even that idealistic or, or strategic. The impetus you know, that led us to start to uh, explore fossil fuel was to address energy needs. Population increased at some point because we had conquered agriculture, actually. Yes. We can have people in much more numbers. You know, there were improvements in healthcare. You know? So energy needs increased. It became quite expensive and tedious to, to continue to use the horse carriage. So and because the human nature itself is very inventive, problems would always beget innovation. So I think the fossil energy where it was good for a time, actually, really. Yeah, it was good for a time. But now we are very happy that the same process of innovation and, and inventiveness that brought us fossil energy is not even taking us in a different direction yeah, to, towards renewables. And for that renewable to actually scale, a lot has to be done. In transmission, sorry, in generation, first of all, in transmission and distribution. So across that energy value chain, there are a lot of opportunities. And believe me, you, I believe the future is rosy. Because there's this man I, I, I got in touch with on, on LinkedIn. He's the chairman of a company in New Zealand. Emerald is a renewable energy company that is trying to uh, solve a problem in energy transmission. Now, unlike the traditional transmission of energy through wires, they want to transmit energy through microwave. And what does that mean? It means that if per adventure, I mean, with what Elon Musk is doing, we can have a very scalable means of moving things that are very heavy into space. We cannot have to generate solar energy in space. So that all those solar panels will now be suspended above Earth orbit to even uh, tap uh, the sun at scale. You know? So you cannot tap it outside the orbit of the Earth and even transmit it not through wire, but through microwave. I mean, so. That's the, very interesting. Yes. Because that also, that's very interesting. Because if you wanted to, for example, use solar power, automatically it means that the parts of the world where the sun, where they have more sun advantage, would have more power advantage, and therefore more profit advantage. But if you don't do that, and you go above the orbit of the world, directly into space, it means you can take directly from sun, and therefore you undercut, you know, the places that have advantage because of sun. At the end of the day, we are talking greed, are we not? Exactly. Isn't that where, how we got here in the first instance? Yes, it's a fact. It's a fact. And if I you know, it's very interesting yeah, because yeah, if yeah, you look yeah, at it immediately yeah, yeah, in terms yeah, of very, world politics, that's yeah, a very good point. You know that that's yeah. that's that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, but you, you know, know, for me, sorry, if I can yes. just continue. You know, the 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 research for the photovoltaics, the solar, it was going full steam ahead by the sixties, and then by the mid sixties, the major fossil fuel companies they saw this thing as an innovation that could cut into their business. You know what they did? They say, hey, y'all, we are, you know, I was in the States. Hey, y'all, we can't allow this to happen. It's gonna mess up our business. You know what they did? They bought out the copyrights for solar all over the world, locked it up in their safe 
for almost 20 something years because they didn't want any more research, the kind of research that he's talking about, which could have jump started the whole thing and we could have avoided. So he's very right in the sense that, hey, the guys doing this, they didn't want to poison the world. They just wanted to have energy. And burning coal was a good way of creating energy, but it was a primitive way because it's fire. Instead of learning from the sun. I mean, if you think about the beauty of a green leaf taking sunlight and then converting that sunlight into energy for the tree to grow and grow and give its fruit and give its wonderful, wonderful resources. This is what the photovoltaic research was supposed to do. I'm open-minded. I want to hear what people want to build. You know? I think still using the example of that boy he, he talked about, uh, I want to use the maxim that a friend of mine is very, I mean, he likes to use that particular phrase a lot. He said, talent, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. Yeah. And that is why in the, in the remote area of, of, of Medugui, there could be a boy of 17 years old without the usual, I mean, literacy and numeracy skills who is naturally inventive, yeah, but without any opportunity you know, to, to put those skills you know, to use. Really. So I think the, the thing that we may do as, as, as a people, really, is to create systems that make it possible to cultivate people like that boy at scale. Exactly. You know, at scale. There are, there are a lot of them across the country, really, wandering the streets, you know, hungry, hungry. But if there's already a system in place, like most serious countries have, to you know, catch people very young, you know, and, and, and play to their strengths, really. Because that same boy who is so inventive can go to school and fail mathematics, as it were. He could even fail English. But the education system must be progressive and aware enough to understand that, no, that guy has got something. So the whole architecture of our education, really, especially at the secondary level, because that is really where people can develop pla what I call platform skills yeah. Yeah, to engage innovation. That makes them adaptable to be trained, you know, for new things, you know, to use new machines, you know, repair new equipments, and understand and catch up with trend. So without scaling the, the, the acquisition of platform skills across the country, from Lagos to Onisha to Medugui, so that even when those new ideas come on board, we will not have keep yeah. It's very interesting you use the term literacy, because literacy in what? Being able to actually communicate. Exactly. The most basic, actually, really. Exactly. So usually we hold people up for not being able to communicate in an accepted language. It does not mean they cannot communicate. It means, so for example, you might get somebody who will fail an exam because he's been asked to translate his ideas into a language he hasn't had exposure yes. to. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I guess. However, the same person already has the innovation, they already, yes. so you need, maybe we need to change our frames of reference. Because now we are asking once again, we need to upscale, where well, we might already have the skill. Yes. We might already have the skills. Yeah, but for me, I think that uh, for me, like I, like, I, like I said earlier, I am quite a realist at times. We are in a global village, and the language of commerce is English. And Africa has not been able to have any language that is quite dominant enough to be a language for communication and training sciences, or like a Russian language, you get, or like Chinese. And those languages have some strengths that make them easy to train people in the in basic sciences. So because we cannot afford to reinvent the wheel, yet, and we're in a global village, and we want to have citizens who are not only productive, but also, also competitive, because it is competitive that will make us a destination, really, to produce most of these new technologies that are just being scaled. So to really get people who are productive and competitive, you really want them to at least, at the, at the most basic level, be able to you know, communicate in, in global language. Yes. So even though it will be tedious. What about the Chinese? The Chinese. Even, even for the Chinese, like I said, the Chinese, the Chinese people, they are very whole people. And if you, if you really uh, if you investigate the technical superiority and strength of the Chinese language, in fact, Chinese language makes learning math extremely easy. You can confirm. And that is just natural. It Have we tried learning maths in Yoruba or in Boho Hausa before? Uh, well, I, well, I know Professor, uh, what's his man? Well, there was one Professor in Ife then who was trying to, I mean, get some things done around that aspect anyway. And he's trying to teach science in, in Yoruba, but the government didn't really follow through. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to really see how that, how that ended. We may try actually anyway, really, to have those structure in place. But 
what it will be satisfying is just is, is, is cultural needs, actually, yet. Not really economic. But of course, it's, I mean, it will be fine to be able to domesticate you know, all those um, signs in our, in our local language. But while we are doing that, it is very important to ensure that people that we are churning out are given enough platform skills of which basic literacy, basic literacy is one of them. So it, it should not be acceptable to us that, okay, a young boy of 16 or 14 in Medugu is inventive and innovative and cannot speak English. No. It will be a plus for us if in addition, that guy, to his invent, if in addition to his innovativeness and inventiveness, he has still been able to have opportunities. Yes. For language, such that if an eventually find himself with a Brit, of course, or with whoever, I mean, he would have that confidence. Let's take a break. <laughs> you know when we take a break, everybody, because I see the audience themselves, everybody's beckoning up, so that we get everybody involved. You know, what will innovation really mean going forward? You know, and how do we out innovate our current problems? Right after the break. <laughs> right, welcome back. It's public eye, and our conversation got really <laughs> very interesting. And I think that we should involve the audience. Maybe from questions, we can find answers. Let's do it the other way around, right? I'm going to start with who's going to go first? The lady at the back in black. So is it possible for us to actually come up with a solution that won't have any side effect and is going to be long lasting? Now, you mentioned humans, that we have to appreciate humans for us to be, we have to get involved in innovations. What about robotics? People keep inventing robots, taking um, places of humans. If it continues, we need not be a kind of dehumanizing. Will uh, humans get to function in the nearest future? Because it's very possible that things that humans are supposed to do, you get, uh, machines will be the one doing those things. and. You, at the, on the long run, it should be like even there might, be, there might be no use for humans again. <laughs> so All that's right. my question. I mean, Mustafa can join at any point if you wanted to ask any, any, any of the questions. So my first question will be for Mr. Mustafa. So um, he was talking about the um, electric cars that he was talking about and all that. So I know about Tesla, that's Elon Musk's um, electric cars and all that and i know they are quite expensive and this is is making these cars in a country where they have some of these resources you can easily get them and this is nigeria we're talking about the you still need power to make these uh vehicles right and you still need some other resources which might be hard to come by so um and you said you were trying to make you know you said something about uh, making cars in nigeria and you know the needs of the people and you know how and it's supposed to be cheaper it's supposed to be easier for us to get so i i don't see that it doesn't feel like it's going to be cheaper so i just want to know how maybe i'm not getting it right maybe you can explain better on that then secondly um maybe i should direct this to mr majeko dumi um, I, I was a science student. I did my secondary school in Lagos here, and I remember when I was when I wanted to g um, go into senior secondary school, and we had to choose uh, departments. When I cho chose science, um, because I was kind of playful and all that, my teachers did not actually believe that I'm a science product per se. You understand? So I had to, you know, prove that I could be in the science class. I had to write English literature, take some. Um, quiz or something like that. But I was very passionate about going into science class. So what if I, I didn't know how to, what if I wasn't good in writing, like you said, the 17 years old boy, he can't write English and all that. What if I was very passionate about going into science and I can't write English very well and I end up not going because of that. And that too, and when I went in science, I noticed we, we didn't do IRK and CRK. That is uh, Islamic religious knowledge and Christian religious knowledge. And later, I think it was because they felt, um, you know, revolution and evolution, like Christians, like religion doesn't go with science. And I think so what, what I just want I'm trying to push out is maybe they should, um, our system, our school system should make it easier for people. Science shouldn't be like it's excluded for the um the people would think are the you know the intelligent ones and all that because english you know your literature and all that could be learnt but somebody a 17 year old in bono can know something in science without being you know uh, 
having much knowledge in English literature and all that. I think we address, I think we address that set, you know, is it actually possible to create innovations that would not be damaging to the environment, to human beings? So is, it, is that a possibility? And two, a lot of work that's going on in robotics, we will get to a point that robots are so advanced that we don't need human beings anymore. If you're going to have a solution uh, that will be everlasting, that will not cause more problem, I mean, I'm sorry to, to break your heart, really. That is practically impossible. And like we normally say on the streets, well, I'll know the finish. Really. Solutions will always beget problem because we are humans. We are not omnipotent and we are never omniscient. Really. We, we cannot see a hundred, a thousand, millennia, centuries from now. So we, within the best of our capacity, anything we do for now would always at some point run its course and new things uh, will come on board. So it is not possible to have a solution that will not beget problem that would also require innovation to solve. Add the finitum, to probably human beings become wiped off from the heads. Right. Thank you. That is the purpose of science itself. You know, that you are continuously engaging. That's life. You continuously engaging. That's why you have to build a robust base. You know, what you know today, you know better tomorrow. Even you as a person, you know, the person you were 10 years ago is not who you are. People who say they don't change, they have not grown. You have to, you know, iPhone 1, iPhone 2, iPhone 12, you know, new iterations all the time. What about robots? Should we worry at the time that the time will come where human beings are no longer necessary, that robots will take over? The bigger, newer technologies of uh, building vehicles uh, going into robotics, just like the Tesla, he, the other guy mentioned earlier, uh, almost all the gigafactories have uh, been, uh, the operations are robotic based. So I believe uh, that would be a problem in the future. But uh, as you've said earlier, always there's always a solution to a problem. I'm sure it's people who will be building that robots. So uh, if you're not engaged in what they are doing, as robots, you might be engaged in building those robots. So, uh, and as you said earlier, science is always uh, revolving. The problem of yesterday is not the problem of today. So, uh, in the future, there will be uh, problems which maybe robots will not be enough to solve that. I mean, there's a school of thought that says then, then, human beings there will have to evolve, won't it? Because if you no longer have to do the things that robots can do, then we can see the full capacity of what human beings can really do. Because right now, human beings are often engaged with things that do not use what makes them human more. And you know, we, 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 need, to, you know, we need to really get into that consciousness of really who we are. And the reality is when you, when you look in a mirror, the reflection that you see, the who you are, is a spirit soul, an energy which science has now determined exactly. can never be created or destroyed. destroyed. Yep. It only changes form. Do you understand? And one of the most fascinating things is who are we really and what are we? We're no also more. energy field that's vibrating. Yeah. So what you see now, yeah. you know, <laughs> don't become too attached <laughs> to it. But, but there was a question from Mustafa regarding the electric cars in particular. That, I mean, that's a really good question. That cost of production in Nigeria is high because of diesel, because, because at the end of the day, the factory still has to have, you know, so how do you power the factory? and so on and so forth. So how can you really de deliver products at, at, a, at a good cost if you have big production costs to deal with in the first instance? Technology goes with culture and it also goes with your environment. Uh, the main issue we have most especially in Africa is uh, we always try to copy the processes on how things are done in other places, most especially the Western world. And when we try to copy that at the end, it costs us much to do that. So that's why most of the products being built using the processes built in the Western world will end up having very high production cost here. 
because here we have a lot of uh, cheap sources of energy. Let me give you an example. The Giga factory they build in Texas by Tesla, they have to mount thousands and thousands of uh, panels, solar panels, so as to bring down the cost of uh, power, so as to also bring down the cost of their production. Here we are in, in a country where we have even much energy. I don't need to buy as many as solar panels Tesla is buying to power up my factory to build uh, the, the vehicles. So, and uh, raw materials also. Uh, we have more access to raw materials here locally in Nigeria than they do in uh, America. Most of their raw materials have been sourced outside the country. But here we are uh, with the bus I'm building right now. We're building a prototype bus, which is going to be built using over 70% of the materials sourced locally. And uh, we have reached almost 90% completion. And uh, when done is going to be the first electric bus, which is built using 70% of materials locally sourced. Thank you very much. But I wanted you to leave everyone with a thought regarding, you know, what the future holds in terms of, you know, pro you know, just protecting the planet as well as innovating in a way that marries nature and um, science. Oh, we've just got to do it. It's our life support system. It's our mandate. And we have wonderful ideas, especially in Africa. Any innovation we do has to be that, okay, is this harmonious with nature? I want to ask you, what are your thoughts? What are you leaving us with? Yeah, my, my thoughts is that uh, for each and every one of us, uh, we must conduct ourselves as, as custodians of nature. So whenever the opportunity arises for us to cut down a little bit on our consumption, whatever that means, we should, we should endeavor to, to do that for ourselves and the coming generation. Thank you. And that's a great place to leave the conversation last so problems are there to be solved. You know, the biggest resource in the world for human beings is the human mind. And what the human mind chooses to do with it in the environment which the human being is for now. Thank you for watching the show. We'll see you again next time. Bye bye now. <laughs>